Okay, hello everyone. Yeah, welcome to my talk. Um, so this is based on a case study that we've done at the University of Leeds where we took a database of um, tweets, just raw tweets uh, that have been geotagged, uh, that we harvested. Um, and we've submitted a fairly technical paper on it about using this tweet information to um, inform a geographical model of the world, which is a spatial interaction model. Um, and that was great. It was a really fun exercise and really kind of gave me some personal first-hand insight into the costs and benefits of these databases. So I'm going to try and avoid talking too much about the technical side of it, um, and especially in the context of the previous talks, I think there's a lot of issues raised about the kind of data that we're using, um, and I think uh, researchers would benefit from thinking more carefully and critically about um, social media data rather than just blindly following what new data sources are available. So that's what this talk is about. I'm using a specific case study to inform a wider debate and I'm really trying to use this opportunity to stimulate debate and say, come on guys, we need to talk about this, uh, these issues. Um, and that will become clear as I've gone on. So to try and structure my talk, I've um, split into these four categories. Uh, an introduction and my perspective, I'm going to provide a bit of a spoiler on the question, can uh, social media data be used in spatial modelling? Um, talk about a little bit of the data and the methods, but what I'm really interested in is this, this discussion. So each slide is trying to build a little bit towards this discussion that I want to have, and I think that it could raise some interesting issues in the questions as well. So here's the spoiler. Well, the question is, can they be useful? Well, yes, obviously they can be useful. That's the answer uh, to the question in the title of my presentation. But that's not the real issue. Um, the real issue is, in what cases are social media more useful? Um, and when do the benefits of using such diverse, some would say low quality data sets, outweigh the costs of doing so? That's the real question that I want to ask. And I think a lot of the time when people embark on doing research with these kind of diverse data sets, they don't think about those questions until after they've done the research, which is the wrong way around. So we need to, to have a kind of framework to think about it, and I've got some preliminary ideas about that. Uh, just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. Uh, in the words of Ed Snowden, and I'm not trying to say that by using Twitter data we are behaving like the NSA, but there certainly are parallels, okay? So it's worth thinking about these kind of things. Uh, you should decide whether we need to be doing this uh, and try and put what we're doing in the wider context. So I'm going to start off up front, let's think about the costs of uh, VGI, Volunteer Geographical Data, or what I call later v VGI SM, VGI from social media. So there's big potential for distraction. Uh, there's a guy called Dan Olner, who's uh, my colleague, and when he discovered the Twitter streaming API, he would just get distracted for minutes on end watching the stream of tweets come onto his street, uh, screen. So it can be distracting uh, on that level and also in a more general sense. The data is so diverse that you can kind of start going into it in many different angles and lose sight of your original aim. So I think it's important to have a clear aim at the outset when you're using these kind of data sets. Um, reduce policy relevance. So when you have an official data set, Think about it. Someone's paid to create this data set. Um, so therefore, it, but kind of by definition, the, it's going to be answering an interesting question. Whereas tweets, it's just whatever comes into people's minds. So there is no guarantee that what comes into people's heads is going to be policy relevant. That is a definite cost of BPI. Naval gazing, there's potential to think about the method rather than about the application. High complexity, so there's time for pre-processing. That I've certainly encountered, uh, there's the it's never enough attitude, because it's a constant stream, you're like, well I just need to stream that extra few tweets and then I can get the result I want, that's a possible cost. It's unrepresentative, the loudest voices are heard most clearly in Twitter data, that is a big problem, Okay, possibly even worse than with official data sets which aren't perfect in themselves. So. Uh, another kind of possible one, which isn't such a problem now uh, with technological advance, but you need big computers and you need to be able to do some coding in some cases, so is it inaccessible? But, let's be honest, there are, big, there are a lot of benefits 
So this is what we've heard most about, the benefits of using VGI. Um, and it's worth facing up to them because they certainly do exist. Uh, it's a new data source for questions previ previously beyond the reach of, su of surveys. So if you want to know about sea kayakers' attitudes to the weather, you you're unlikely to be able to write a survey for that. You can just get some information from this virtual, uh, this volunteer geographical information. It's constant and ever-increasing flow of information, okay? It's not going to go away, so it's there forever. Unlike a survey, where it has a survey period and then it just ends. Lots of big benefits to think about. Diversity, low cost and comprehensive, both of the space. We've got uh, maps of entire cities, like basically increasingly the entire world is sending out social media messages um, and over time. So the paper's purpose, uh, purpose really, that's also in the, in the booklet, is to explore these costs and benefits in the context of spatial modelling and to really raise this debate and say this is something we need to talk about. So moving on to part two, doing okay for time. Uh, this is the case study. So to be specific, um, we harvested tweets um, from roughly the area represented on the map. It's about 200 square kilometres. And the case study that um, I was kind of parachuted in to look at, because I started at Leeds in October, um, was to say, okay, well, we've got this database of all geographically tagged tweets, but what can this tell us about um, the movement of people to and from entertainment facilities, specifically museums? So the, the starting point for me was to say, okay, what are these museums of interest? I used the OpenStreetMap data set, which is in itself ge uh, volunteer geographical information, uh, to identify and then verify 15 major um, museums in the area which are plotted on the map there. Okay, um, the next slide shows the tweet data which is over a slightly larger data set. So I was given a million tweets to deal with. That's quite a lot of information but with modern computers it's uh, quite feasible to deal uh, with. So about 50 months of data um, and we got the um, the, the bounding box is roughly around there, where you can see that. Strangely, some tweets were, came from outside the bounding box, which shows we don't fully understand how the uh, Twitter API was working in that case. Um, and then the green triangles there, they're really important. That's the location, their kind of favoured location, away from the museum tweets, which is uh, likely to be, in many cases, home locations. Um, so how are we going to go from those million tweets about anything on uh, anything at all to one specifically about museums? I'm fairly sure that all 1,500 tweets on that map are actually um, linked to museum visits. How did I get there? Well, I used two um, systems, semantic filters and spatial filters. The semantic filters uh, linked back to the previous talk um, on natural language. Uh, which is basically a sophisticated version of regex, regular expressions. Um, and you can search for terms and then you can say stuff like, you can say search for exhibit and then you can say capital E or you can include different spellings of it and stuff like that. But, um, and then the second one, which I think in some ways more important, is to try and validate if it actually is about what we think it's about, the spatial filter. So we created a buffer around each museum using a package in R called Osma um, and if it was within 50 metres of that bounded box we can be fairly certain or we, we, it's highly likely that that tweet is about a specific museum. So moving on, part three, the model and the results which is still not the most interesting part of it for me but um, it was a good opportunity to write some R code and to create a spatial interaction model. So uh, Normally people start with the theory and the maths and then go into the code. My mind works with the code and then look at it in maths. So um, you have a, a nested for loop where you um, do, first of all, for each of the um, origin populations, um, and then another for loop, you create uh, this F, which is representative of the amount of flow between each origin and destination. So basically, you end up with a matrix. This has the dimension in number of rows, the number of origins, in terms of columns, the number of uh, destinations. 
and then you just add in all of your parameters, some of them with the I filter, some of them with the J, and that's your distance uh, matrix which has both I and J, um, which is Euclidean matrix. It looks more beautiful with maths, um, and what's interesting about this research project, I'm really in favour of reproducibility, so I've created a reproducible example of this spatial interaction model, which I uploaded onto GitHub this morning on the train. Um, so you can download that and run it and play about with it for yourself. Um, aggregation, so when you've got such a diverse range of data, um, it, it's uh, vital, if you're doing a spatial interaction model, to have some kind of spatial aggregation. So the tweets are coming from all over the show, but when we develop the spatial interaction model, we use the centroid of each zone. Um, but I'm not going to go into that because I really want to get onto the discussion stage. Um, but I think there's more data needed to be able to calibrate it. Um, the result is that we did actually uh, set up a spatial interaction model and then we modified it slightly. We changed one of the parameters, which is the beta decay value, based on a comparison between uh, what the aggregated tweets told us and what the aggregated model results told us. That allowed us to do some calibration, and that's what's shown in this graph. We had three different specifications of the model, um, and in each case, we found the best fit between the two data sets. Okay, so that's, that's the case study. It was fun to do, and a very interesting project. But what I really want to talk about um, in this presentation is what this tells us. Okay, I think that the results in themselves are not massively interesting. It's relatively small amounts of data, and we know that people who are close to museums are more likely to visit that museum than another one. But I think this has got large methodological implications. Um, potentially new ways to corro corroborate theoretical models. There are a lot of theoretical models about how people behave, and this provides a new and very rich data set um, that we can start to use to try and corroborate which ones work and which ones don't. I've created some reproducible uh, code on tweets, um, and as I say, that's on, online. But there's some really interesting ethical issues raised that I didn't really get to talk about in the technical paper, which I want to talk about. Who created the data set? Well, the public created it, just voluntarily because they felt like it. Who owns the data set? Well, Twitter owns the data set. Um, and who will benefit from the data? Who knows? That's kind of up to us, to some extent, if we're using it. So. Um, that those questions link into the kind of follow the flow of money and you'll find the answers. Um, and I've recently been involved in a project that's looking at uh, tweets related to Hurricane Sandy. Um, and the Leeds School of Geography paid $2,000 to a private company for the public information on tweets to then use uh, for hopefully public benefit. But you have this kind of strange circle where it goes from the public realm into the private realm, and then back into the public realm again, and no one really knows what they're doing with the data set. So I want to make the argument that we really should make a big effort to, um, when we're using these publicly provided data sets, to say what is the public benefit of doing this. And I must admit, in my case, looking at a spatial interaction model of museum visits, I can't do that. So it also links into this idea of too much data. I've put a pretty hard-hitting quote up there from uh, Nicholas Taleb uh, from Anti-Fragile, book from 2012, and he's highly critical of big data. He says, big data is a version of cherry-picking that destroys the entire spirit of research and makes the abundance of data extremely harmful to knowledge. Okay, that's quite a statement to make. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I com completely agree with that, but I think it's worth raising that data, uh, that issue, to anyone who's using these big data sets. We need to think about it and we need to talk about it. I think that um, these data sets massively increase the importance of being transparent about what we're doing. People who are tweeting it, whether they know it or not, are being transparent about their thoughts. So it's kind of our responsibility as researchers to be transparent about what they're, we're doing with their data sets. So you can see, uh, I think it's a great uh, kind of cartoon to illustrate this. You've got the guy who's working away with his machine that he doesn't really understand, the black box, feeding it data, feeding it money, and it, at the end of it, he, it uh, produces a result. Um, and this guy is kind of coming in. He's called the uh, homeless economist and just saying, what's going on? We need to start asking that question. 
like the guy there and start questioning what we're doing and I think that can have a, a very big benefit in terms of the public benefit um, and also the quality of research that we're getting out of this data set and also questioning you know when when is a good up time to use it. So in terms of outputs, so we've got a paper under review for geospatial information science. I would really love to get a discussion paper out of this, building on the paper that's in um, the, the GISRUC book there. Um, so any suggestions about that uh, would be great, because primarily I'm a quantitative geographer, but I really want to kind of talk about these ethical issues. I do want to create a working paper on spatial interaction models, building on something that, again, is reproducible, trying to make these uh, models more accessible. But I think there are some useful conclusions I can draw from this already, um, and they are um, primarily what kind of circumstances, going back to the real question is, what kind of circumstances are these volunteer geographical information from social media, VGISM, as I've called it in a slightly awkward acronym? Um, well, I think from my research and my experience, I'd say phenomena that are ephemeral, so they can't, they're not picked up by a social survey so easily. Um, ones where people actually have time to tweet, and subjects that can be, to some extent, validated by whether they're near the location, um, rather than just making a whole range of assumptions. Um, and based on my previous comment about the public providing the data, I would argue that we should use it to focus, try and answer questions that are very clearly in the public benefit because the public are providing the data. Um, and then I guess what this whole kind of session is about is using social media for public engagement. I think there's huge untapped potential here. For example, encouraging people to write a certain hashtag if they feel in danger on the road. Uh, trying to get people to use social media to engage with your research rather than just passively collecting what they're putting in. So it can be a really powerful tool for engagement. Um, so there are some follow-up things. I didn't want to focus too much on the reference list. Um, check out an interview with uh, Edward Snowden, which I think is very interesting and relevant to any researchers using social media data. I've got some reproducible code up online, so play about with it. Um, and you can even set up your very own Twitter listener. Um, we can do that after if anyone's interested and there's a big data backlash. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you found my talk interesting and that it actually raises um, the debate. So thank you. Thank you.